Welcome to Ambient Discourses, conversations with musicians and composers who create musical experiences and sonic landscapes. My guest on the program is British singer-songwriter turned ambient musician, Will Sampson. His budding career as a musician is off to a tremendous start, has transcended genre limitations with his free-willed approach to music composition, and with his latest album, Harp Swells, has shown his ability to tap into deep human emotions and experiences with both instrumental ambient music and lyrical minimalism. Our conversation was entirely interesting to me, and it steered through topics like his background and sources of inspiration, how music can shape culture, balancing his own self-expression with writing for the listener, and much more. I think you're going to like this interview. So let's get straight to it. My conversation with Will Sampson. Hi, Will. It's wonderful to have you on the program. I'm really excited to get to know you. Uh, for our listener, this is going to be a little bit different. Um, generally, we interview um, um, straight on ambient artists or neoclassical artists, but Will, you kind of span a few different genres, and I'm really excited to talk with you and to get to know you. Uh, learn more about your music and what drives you. But anyways, welcome to the program. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> Let's, before we start diving into your music and philosophy and other things like that that drive you, let's get to know you a little bit more. Uh, can you tell me how you got started into music and what sort of inspired you to start this journey out? Um, well, I was... I mean, my first instrument is the drums, actually. Mm. Even though, like, most of my music now doesn't have any percussion. But that's where it all started with being really excited about music from a young age. So, um, yeah, I started having drum lessons at school and got really obsessive with with playing drums. Like, I, I would literally run between classes to get so that there was like a little practice space at my school. Um, and I was generally the only one that used this small room with the drum. So I'd, um, I would literally run between classes to play drums for maybe three minutes and then run to the, to the next class. And so now I'm much older looking back, I realized that, okay, that like was not, <laughs> that was not normal. Um, but in a, in a really nice way. Yeah. So um, that's where like a really strong passion for music started. And then like, I played in bands and stuff as a teenager. And I guess a major turning point was on my 18th birthday, my dad bought me an eight track. It, it was like a, a digital eight track. So this would have been like 2007, something like that. And yes, yeah, so that's when I got got into making solo music, and it's just been a steady thing since then. Mm. What were some of the things that what were some of the themes and ideas that you were processing at the time when you would write your some of your first songs? What were some of the things that were that you were curious about and expressing yourself about? Hmm. I well, I wasn't. I certainly wasn't consciously thinking about well, all of the early stuff was instrumental actually. Mm. So I wasn't writing any lyrics and so that meant I didn't consciously have to think about the themes or the stuff that I might be processing. Um, and I mean, at that age, like 16, 17, 18, I was most likely just learning how to record and probably replicating the other actors that I loved at the time. Mm. Who, was, uh, who were some of your inspirations back then? Um, I think one of the bands that really... Like, at, at the drive-in, I discovered them when they were... when I was 16, and they, like, really blew my mind. Mm. And then that led me into a friend who was a bit older recommended explosions in the sky 
Mm -hmm. And so that was the first time I was hearing more kind of ambient infused music. And then I discovered the album Leaf around that time, who I actually ended up touring with like many years later. Um, so they were definitely a, a really important artist for me, mm. at least when I when I first started making music myself. Mm -hmm. But it was all just, yeah, those first recordings were, it was mostly a, acoustic guitar, because I didn't have an electric guitar at, the, at that time. It, you know, it would have basically been like a acoustic guitar and a really basic almost like a karaoke microphone directly into the eight track yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it's funny when i there was a while ago i somehow came across some really early recordings that i'd done and i was kind of amazed at how okay they sounded <laughs> <laughs> i guess because you have no control over eq or right things like that and then you're so extremely limited by equipment it's all about like how you perform the tracks and you know you, you find a way to make things work mm -hmm. yeah you find you find some of those within your limitations the the creative force to like just pr press through i remember when <laughs> when when I first started out, I was, and this is forever ago, this is going to really date me, but when I, my first access to be able to record my own music, when I just started out guitar, I had this all-in-one, and this is back in 1990, I had this all-in-one console. It had the dual cassette deck, it had a turntable on top, because mm -hmm. I'm old, <laughs> and it had but it had these multi button functions where you you know you had to press a button to engage the 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 turntable or the cassette deck but there was also a button for a microphone so you could con record into the multi deck but i figured out quite by accident that if i pressed in more than one button at the same time I could engage multiple things at the same time. Mm. So I made my own multi-track recorder oh, wow. <laughs> out of a wow, that's really cool. task cam, all in one thing. And of course, you got maybe three passes at most before er everything was shh. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Get yeah. lots of noise going on there. Noise before it was cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's 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 dive in a little bit further so looking back to your discography when when did you really start making headway for yourself uh, so you, you'd been writing your own songs and and what was it that really started catching other people's attention like the attention of uh record labels or the touring or or starting to build up a bigger audience um well i guess the the first sort of official album would have been Balance, which was in 2012. Mm -hmm. And I had also, I was living in Berlin at the time and I became good friends with this guy Florian, who I'm still very good friends with, who but the album was already kind of halfway done uh, when we met. And then he was also really into tape recording. Basically, I met two really like pivotal people at that time who like opened my eyes to kind of recording techniques that I still use uh, to this day. Mm. Like one of them was my friend Florian who had a little home studio and basically made all of my recordings sound 10 times better. <laughs> and I was also living with a guy, a Swedish guy called Joel, who now has a project called Sven Wunder there's been doing really well lately like a lot of people are discovering his music over the last couple of years but he sold me his old Tascam uh, I think it's the 488 it's the grey 8 track which just sounds like the preamps and it just really has a magic sound mm. and 
so yeah the, the first album was was made on that over about six months and it's funny looking back on that time i'm not sure what quite happened but basically that album before it was released it got passed around uh to like a bunch of um different labels like mostly in the states actually so there was a period of time where i start like i started receiving some emails from like these amazing like pretty big indie labels who were interested in releasing it and one of them uh was suggesting that i should kind of treat the album more like a demo and that we would re-record it mm. and at that time it's funny like i just politely but um confidently said no thank you like i i just spent six months making this thing that i'm really proud of so it didn't make any sense to me mm -hmm. to um even consider re-recording it mm. so um yeah, it's a funny, I don't know if I've ever really had the same amount of label interest that I did back then. Um, but long story short, I ended up releasing it with a label that was based in Berlin as well. And then, so that was in 2012. And then off the back of that, I was relatively briefly with quite a big booking agency that put me on a bunch of support tours and things mm. and so uh that's kind of where it started and it's been a like most musicians it's been a very up and down path since then yeah yeah so during during uh, and i can empathize with the the low periods that you experience that you probably experience even with the support of a label what what sustains you during those times when you're when it's all work and it's all slogging it and you're you're trying to keep the momentum going what what sustains you well lately i don't know whether it's i assume it might actually be a consequence of the pandemic but I think last year I received more messages, like kind of random messages from people or even people that I spoke to at shows who shared me sometimes these like very touching stories about how they had discovered the music and how it's helped them through sometimes quite a difficult time of their life. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, those moments make me realize oh wow like this really does have value and this is really worth something it, it may be going to a very small audience but when i've received messages like that i actually have a a section on my phone um where i've screenshot messages and i've labeled it something like keep going yeah so i can remember like when i have periods of uh, feeling disheartened or whatever it is mm -hmm. i remember these messages that i've received and how like what well, really does have value to some people out there and that's that's an amazing thing mm. that's got to feel really good <laughs> and th it, when when you've made a connection with other people like that yeah it really does that make it make it worth make makes the you know if you have periods where it feels a little rocky receiving messages like that like really do make a difference let's pause the conversation for just a moment we're going to check out one of the tracks from will's brand new album harp swells this is called beatrice theremin here on ambient discourses
drawing kind of a parallel to that. So when the the single and yet came across my desk, normally, if uh, normally if it's not if it doesn't fall under the category of ambient music, neoclassical, or your general kind of semi-meditative instrumental music normally it just got kind of goes into all right that was really cool bin <laughs> doesn't really work but there was something different about and yet for me that was like all right this is different it it was kind of ambient in nature but it was also this it was almost like this mantra this meditative feeling of stopping in a moment and that I belong right here right now and yeah and so that just stopping to hear that message for me was like yeah all right this is good I'm gonna make an exception to my rule and (laughs) this is gonna be added to our programming because it just it was a nice way of interrupting the mind you know how you, your mind goes on autopilot and and mm-hmm. just stopping and reflecting on our presence in this whatever space we find ourselves in in earth and that everything is even even though the outside might be chaotic the, even though the outside might be really filled with things that could be I don't know, leaving one feeling distraught. There was a peace, there was a peace and a serenity in that. And so adding that to your list of (laughs) messages that I thought, I thought it was really, really placid. Can you tell me more about what inspired that song and the writing behind it and what, what you were going through, what you were feeling? Sure. Um, Well, thank you. Uh, for sharing that with me, it's really lovely to hear, and it's it is how I hoped it would be received, and um, because it's so it's, that's the one track with lyrics in this upcoming ambient album, and even though it has lyrics at the centre, I really wanted it to really not stick out from the rest of the album um you know i wanted i didn't want the lyrics to kind of distract from the feeling mm-hmm. of the other instrumental tracks on the album and so the yeah I, I wanted to approach it like a mantra like um something that's done in meditation and yeah i have a, a very specific uh, memory of writing that song and writing the lyrics because I I had this amazing studio space like 10 minutes walk from my house and it was a visiting resident using one of the rooms and she was there for a few weeks and sort of once a day would usually have a, a short lunch break and share a cup of tea and just talk about things and we had this long conversation one day about like belonging and about uh, sort of widespread family trees and how that's both sort of sometimes put us in situations where we maybe feel like we're searching for home or maybe feel like we don't quite belong. And then I kind of went back to my studio space and after that conversation, this song just appeared like very naturally and very quickly and i remember i wrote those lyrics down and for a while i i was sat with my notebook and i was trying to add more and make it into like quote unquote a real song right (laughs) like with a you know with a verse and a chorus and yeah and then i just i sat with those lyrics and i was thinking this sums everything up like I don't need to add like any any other lyrics I add to the song would have felt just unnecessary. Mm-hmm. I just looked at those lyrics and thought, okay, well, this sums up everything I want to say in this moment. 
and also really summed up you know how I'd been feeling for a while and uh, so I just wanted to leave it as that like I've that sums it up so uh, let's just keep it as like why say anymore I'm so glad that you stopped it's it's perfect it I, I think that we don't do that enough as, as artists. We Sometimes we just need to stop. Just stop mm-hmm. and just let it be what it is. It doesn't have to fill the formula, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, for the perfectly crafted song. And I think that there's, yeah. there's something in there that it just feels like this universal thing that we can all latch on to and all mm-hmm. feel connected to yeah uh, I hope so (laughs) yeah yeah talking about the human experience related relating to this um, what do you feel like the role of your music is as it relates to the human experience or the human condition do you feel what do you feel like your role is there I can say that quite without without really thinking about it. It's just healing is the word that comes to my mind. And I had this really vivid memory of a few years ago seeing a friend's band play and someone was chatting to him after the show. And he said something along the lines of like, oh, like music is about celebration. Like that's for him. Like that's what music is, a celebration in and i remember sort of thinking to myself oh that's of course like it can be a celebration that's a great wonderful thing but without ever really stopping to think about it i think i've always approached it as some form of healing Mm. um yeah and it's funny because i like now you know i i do tend to receive these messages where unintentionally I've um, played a part in some kind of healing process for someone and also as I get a little bit older I'm kind of surrounded by therapists as well okay it's like uh, some of my very close friends are either therapists already or training to become therapists and um I often feel like the universe is pushing me towards like doing the same mm. and um, I at least in the meantime I hope that I can maybe put some of that energy into making music instead yeah 100 percent. i don't see why not it's i mean if if the universe is kind of propelling you in that direction even if it's gently and almost mm. effortlessly and that's i think i'm not one for necessarily signs but i think that that's i think that that's a valid observation i i think that music does have this ability to heal and of course to your friend's point about you know it's it's also celebration it's many things Mm -hmm. i was talking about stefano contini with stefano contini of entheogenic sound explorers and and we talked about music as this idea of conversation uh Mm -hmm. especially as especially in the collaborative space when you're involved with other musicians or, or you're creating uh cross collaborating from people from around the world but i i think that the idea of this kind of healing conversation of giving people the space to work out whatever they're whatever they're going through whatever there's in their mind at the moment and when you as the writer you're writing from a a deep space within you that and it's guttural and it's honest and it's there's no pretense that becomes universally relatable Mm, Uh, yeah i mean it, it has to always of course come from a purely authentic 
sincere place and you know more often than not those are the those are the ones that people really connect with yeah yeah i think people i think people can tell when you're being either disingenuous or you're just i don't know making music for music's sake and it's not yeah. from a deep space yeah and then at that point i just wonder like well what's the point right like surely the whole purpose like if it's if it's not coming from that space then it, it, I, what's the point Let's check out another track from Will's brand new album, Harps Wells. This is the track that came across my desk and drew me in. This is entitled, And Yet, here on Ambient Discourses. points in our life we encounter these touch point moments and for me you know it's been numerous things throughout my life but things that shape our understanding of the world and shape our understanding of other human beings and ourselves uh, can you share a, a significant moment in your life when uh, music or something else it doesn't even just have to be music something deeply impacted your life and your understanding of the world and, and the cosmos and your place and all of that sure um, well I mean the, the easiest one would be losing my dad because um, my dad passed away when I was it was actually just before the first album came out, mm. before Balance, and um, so I was I think, 22 at the time, mm -hmm. and 
you know, we were we were very close, and he was someone that I would talk to a lot about music and kind of any whenever something exciting related to music would happen, he would be the first one yeah. I'd speak to. So, like, of course, like losing a parent at that age has a massive impact, and then. Oh, you know, it, it of course affected the music I made for many years afterwards. And, you know, there are some, it, it does, of course, make you view life differently and you do slip back into, you know, worrying about things that don't matter. But then if you come back to that space, you, uh, it of course it puts things into perspective mm. and yeah. I think any, anyone that's had a a close experienced close loss you know there's that period of your life before and then there's that period that's kind of clearly defined period afterwards um, and it was it's sort of strange the way it sort of tied into that second chapter kind of started just as the the first album came out so um yeah i mean that would that's an easy question to answer because that's of course yeah. had, a, had a big impact yeah totally what were some things in your life that that changed that you noticed maybe not necessarily right away but over time you're like mm -hmm. well, yeah i'm I, maybe processing things differently or responding sure. to things differently yeah I, I mean i think um it just i think music kind of became it was already the the sort of central focus of my life at that point anyway but then it it also for better or worse kind of became the central focus of me trying to process that and as cliche as it sounds like of course it was a form of therapy mm. for me and um like there were several times like writing lyrics but you know per, per those sort of first few years of, of grief you know you tend to feel quite numb and at least that was my experience and there was a couple of times writing lyrics where these words would come out and then I'd just suddenly feel myself yeah. like crying. And um, so that was, you know, very clearly a, a direct form of therapy for me. And, um, you know, it's, it's only recently that I, my experience of music was always like the music that I loved was completely immersive and made you feel as deeply as possible. And that's without ever consciously thinking about it. That's how I wanted to, that's how I always approached music as well. And only like relatively recently, I realized like, Oh, that's like totally not everyone's experience. I like naively thought that that's, was everyone's experience of music like this you know powerful magical mm -hmm. thing and yeah. i remember having a, a conversation with a friend who's quite open about how how he doesn't want to feel like so deeply um and he often like he he i think it, the conversation started with him making a joke about like oh i like your music but i have to turn it off after five minutes because it makes me feel too much <laughs> <laughs> which is like a, a very very british response perhaps but it, it sort of started this conversation about like me realizing like, oh wow that's like not everyone wants that mm -hmm. right and like of course um you know i also love music that's light and just about about celebration and lightness yeah. and um but uh, i can't imagine 
being involved with music that didn't feel make you feel as deeply as possible mm -hmm. even if that feeling is like joy right you know it's nice though that that your friend who is yeah i don't want to feel anything in the music and maybe it's probably a bit of a viewing music as more an accessory than a focal point but mm -hmm. it's good that you continue to show your generosity of feelings in what you're processing through so that well if he wants to he can always go <laughs> and consume yeah. it on his own time yeah and probably yeah. and probably in secret without letting anyone know that yeah. he's experiencing these things yeah yeah <laughs> i'm curious uh in your opinion what role do you think your music or any music really has in shaping society and culture in in light of you know some people don't want you know they they want the more passive listening experience you know they're more of a consumer than they are um, a participant in the music and by participant i don't necessarily mean the musician because you can you know as we both know you can actively and deeply listen to something and feel like a participant in that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um what role do you think music has for shaping culture from your vantage point um interesting because i guess there's so many different facets of culture right mm -hmm. and I mean, if, if you look back through um, the history of humanity, you know, music's been like really central always. Yeah. And um, so I imagine it's always going to be this very deep, powerful thing. You know, even if you see it's incredible when you see like really young kids responding to music, maybe they've never seen anyone dance before and they'll hear something and just intuitively start dancing. So from, you know, from that side of things, of course, it's, it's hugely important or it's, it's hugely, it's deeply ingrained in us already, it seems. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, culturally, it's funny because, um, like, for example, I never expected this to happen, but it does seem like that there's this quite big, second wave of, of interest in ambient music as we come out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it, it really seems to me that a lot of people are listening to more ambient music because perhaps they're, they're processing the, the bizarre wild ride of 2020 to yeah. 2022. Um, you know, of course, that's a, that's a cultural thing as well. It's interesting how many ambient musicians that I've come across that started creating ambient music in 2020 or 2021. Oh, uh, really? Like, substantial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you look at when their, their discography started and it's 2021 <laughs> mm. or 2022. And by extension, many of these artists that I've talked to, it's their it's their therapy, which, by mm -hmm. the way, is much cheaper <laughs> than going to see a therapist week in week out. Well, it has the potential to be a lot more expensive, of course, yes, for the equipment yes. wise, but <laughs> sure. yeah. but um, it's been an. It, a serious form of exp of therapy for people processing through and working through these things and it's i th i think you've I, I think your observation is correct that there is there's something about the universal hell that we all lived through well most of us lived through um and coming out the other end, of the other side of this, it's it's almost like we need this post mortem to really mm -hmm. process through these things. Yeah, and like even for 
like making the the record that's coming out in September. Like I really, when I finished the previous album, I really thought to myself, like oh, I don't think I'm gonna make like another ambient record again. I just felt like it was kind of out of my system a little bit. Like I'd made I'd made a couple of EPs before that were entirely instrumental, ambient, and then usually always included at least one ambient track on the other albums. But then when it came to like making new music again, I just I felt like I didn't have anything to say. Mm. Or like I didn't you know, it was it was really I just had no impulse to write lyrics. Yeah. And but at the same time, you know, wanted to make music and then this this album appeared and it's I guess it's you know, can be classified as an ambient album. And yes, I wonder if maybe that's a, been a similar experience for other people. Yeah, I think so. I I, I resonate with that. That's it's part and parcel why I I stopped writing lyrical content back in I don't know what the mid two thousands. I occasionally wrote lyrical songs, but by and large like you're saying i felt like i ran out of things to say and didn't have anything mm. really important to say mm. and and that or maybe even another way of rephrasing it is that the things that i wanted to say could not be conveyed with words mm-hmm. yeah the idea of how can you express deep deeply seated feelings or experiences things that like the the ephemeralness of life and th- how do you capture that adequately into words mm-hmm. it, it almost yeah, exactly it almost takes a little bit of a page out of taoist <laughs> philosophy yeah. the yes. idea that well you can't name the nameless you can't you can't put words the, yeah. in fact the Taoist tradition they're very suspicious of putting words to things mm. but, yeah it's really interesting yeah because it's i mean even as a listener there's there's certain albums that i've been listening to for probably over 10 years at this point and i still love so much that these uh, instrumental albums and Every time I listen to it, there's, there might just be like certain songs or even certain moments in songs that are just there's just this indescribable mm. magic. Let's check out this absolutely gorgeous piece from Will Sampson. It comes from his album Balance, and this is entitled Oceans Are Wilder, here on Ambient Discourses.
What have been some of the albums that you've been really returning to frequently? Um, there's an album by a band called Do Make Say Think called And Yet and Yet, which I think it came out in 2000, maybe late 90s. But that's now, I, I guess I discovered that album when I was around 18. And I'm 34 now, and I've been listening to it ever since. Um, and there's a track on, it's the last track on the album called Anything For Now. And every time I listen to that song, it really, it reminds me of the, the magic of, of music and like why I've dedicated so much in my life and energy and time into this thing and uh, you know and i can never describe it's just this this it's just something there and of course some other people might listen to that album or that to that song and just not connect with it but for whatever reason like there's just this little spark it's in, in that album and specifically that song it's interesting how stuff like that can click for some people and not for other people. What, what do you think's behind all that? I, 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 I think it's, of course there's just, I mean, there's other music that I might not connect with that friends might love, but wow. often I wonder if it's just things like need to be given space. And actually that album, which has been a clear favorite of mine for so many years, I wasn't that into at first. Mm. And actually this was around the time of, you know, I would have bought that album in like 2006, something like that. So I had like a physical copy. And I remember, even though I wasn't totally into it at first, I just kept on listening to it. and. It grew on me more and more, and then mm. I, you know, I, I wonder if that's something that just gets lost so much now that things aren't really given um, the space that they need to connect with people. And I, like I knew that that was going to be. It's it's actually part. Of the album is called And Yet and Yet. So it's part of the reason I called the song And Yet because it's been, you know, so it's just been by my side for so long. And in a similar way, I knew that that single, because it's so slow mm -hmm. and kind of unravels so slowly that it, it would pass a lot of people by, even people that know and like my music already. You know, maybe it, there was a thousand other songs that they wanted to listen to the same yeah. day that that was released and then it just kind of got swept up into the ocean of music that's out there that's a beautiful expression that you point out that sometimes these to put it in some other words they almost need time to breathe in mm -hmm. the space I, and it's reflected sure. it's reflected in your single and yet in that it feels slightly out of time like it's 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 it the the vocals just kind of come in together when they're ready and mm -hmm. not hurried or rushed along and i think it invites the listener to listen with patience and to listen with openness and to slow slow down the brain <laughs> slow mm -hmm. slow down our processing and our thoughts and and approach it with more of an openness to and a deeply and deeply listen f to how the words kind of meet you right where where you're at. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, that was my my hope and my intention for the whole album. So that's it's great to hear. Oh, I'm really excited to hear the rest of the album. I <laughs> there was something about this song, and it just and and I could feel 
the energy behind it and hearing you talk about the 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 rest of the album is on ambient nature it, it really teases me into want to have a deep listening experience with this because if from a creative choice if if this is the only song that has lyrical content and the lyrical content is really simple in nature but deep and profound it speaks volumes to how that this becomes this touch point moment then in the whole album that, that you have this experience of um, being taken through different kind of metaphysical th feelings and memory and thought and it, but it all in texture and mm -hmm. in tone and then and and then the song comes about and yet so i'm <laughs> i'm really excited to hear the the whole package from start to finish well i was actually i was sort of hesitant about releasing that song only because like in an ideal world i actually would have just released the whole album at once right because it it feels like um that's that's really um how it's supposed to be listened and i know it's it's funny it's the first time i'm releasing something where like i know in advance like okay like some I, this is probably gonna like pass a lot of people by even people that are already aware of my music but i do think that um when it's given kind of time and space then there'll be a my hope is at least that there'll be perhaps a small number of people that really deeply connect with it well i'm at least one <laughs> yeah. on on that note it's i find that's a it's a tough balance to for the creator when finding the balance between writing f for the sake of self-expression and making your observations about the world, about the universe, versus writing for the audience. You know, you're writing, mm -hmm. crafting the perfect single or crafting music to reach out into or, or to be included on certain playlists, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Where... Where do you find the balance in all of that for yourself as a creator? Um, I mean, my approach has always been like, don't think about that at all. Mm. And it's funny this, like you mentioned at the beginning, how the music that I've released has kind of spanned a few different genres and you know, in terms, if I had a manager, they'd probably tell me, like, I've shot myself in the foot over the years doing that. Or, you know, maybe it's maybe it's, it's possibly held me back doing that in some way. But I always think, but like that, that's just what, I didn't really intentionally do that. It's just like what came out when I sat down to make music and, so I feel like that always has to be the approach. And of course, if you sit down with the intention of, of writing a, a song for anything other than just expression, it's, it's probably not going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I would say though that this, um, this album, I did set this very clear intention with myself of, Actually, I was thinking a lot about these messages that I'd received over the last year and how much kind of strength, I suppose, that had given me to continue releasing music. And so I wanted this album to... I, I really had those people and those messages at the back of my head when I was making this music, and I wanted it to be a, a gift like a, i wanted to kind of gift space mm. that was the intention for the album and whereas before you know i just 
you know, was essentially making music to feel better or to express something that I didn't have words for. You know, it was it was really like a a therapeutic process for me. Mm. And making this album, I at the time I was thinking, well, I I feel pretty good, and there's nothing that I really, you know, I, I feel quite healed these days, and I didn't feel like there was anything specific that I needed to say, and so so. I, do you feel like this is the first album that had a clear intention of of gifting it to the people that were going to listen mm. attentively? Yeah, that's that's and that is a priceless gift. The gift of something that you've birthed out of your own experiences, your your mind, your heart, your motion and and the craft of songwriting and that's that is a tremendous gift and i i it just delights me to hear your selflessness in that and w wishing for that space and that time to process and heal and continue on with a feeling of greater like sense of purpose or connected connectedness to you to the world to life around us and I, i'm just it's such a delight to hear another artist thinking selflessly like this and like i really want i just really want people to be touched by this experience and so yeah keep going <laughs> <laughs> thank you all right i've got one more track for you this comes from will sampson's 2022 release active imagination which is also available on limited edition 12 inch vinyl and cd at willsampson.bandcamp.com this track i am just absolutely in love with it's called rp here on ambient discourse
So, of course, Brian Eno, the grandfather of ambient music, of course, famously coined the phrase, and I'm paraphrasing here, that ambient music is simultaneously ignorable as it is remarkable. Tell me from your point of view, what makes a memorable ambient composition? I think um, just that it has to, it has to feel, I want it to feel like uh, deep sea diving, mm. like this fully immersive space where um, you, know, you can almost experience that same kind of silence that you would if, if you were diving under the water. Mm. And then, you know, I guess from a kind of a songwriting perspective, I think there's this amazing thing of you can have a, a 10 second loop and you know it's done its job really well when only after a long time you realize, oh, this is just the same thing repeating because you've been so yeah. uh, hypnotized with it. So I think um, to, to answer simply, I would just say it needs to be fully immersive. Mm. I like that. I like the visual of the deep sea diving. That's because you, you can't escape it. It's all around you. It's tactile. You can feel it, mm. touch it. With this particular record, I did actually, I always liked this idea of... Um, making music that kind of sounded like it was underwater mm -hmm. which you do get with certain maybe why i love tape so much and i've always worked with it because it has this or it can have this uh, magical sh sort of shimmering quality mm. but with this record the feeling i wanted to capture was so i i had this the the window looks directly out onto the river so all I really see is the water and that was the feel I wanted the album to feel the same way that view mm. made me feel and you know of course throughout the the day you get the the changing in light and that affects the water as well and there were there were several times that the process of making it where you know, maybe I'd get frustrated with something or like a, a piece of equipment wasn't working or, you know, maybe mm -hmm. some technical thing that was causing some problems. And then I had a rule that I'd just stop, like look out the window and remind myself, like, it needs to just remember, like, it should, I want this process to be as free flowing as the water outside. Mm -hmm. And like that view is how I want this album to feel and it really did work mm. like in terms of just being able to let go of frustrations whether it meant just having to stop and take a break mm. and then come back um if if i was feeling frustrated then some, then i should stop like i didn't want to kind of fight through it in the ways that i, that I may have with previous records mm. um yes that that was very much the feeling that yeah. i was i was reaching for you'd mentioned of course the the river was an inspiration in and in water have there been other things outside of nature that have been a direct source of inspiration for you maybe uh, a, f a favorite author or book or f philosophy or anything that that's that has really been a a source of fuel for you when you create in the past it would have been there was a period where i was really into i, I guess you couldn't lose the term it as eastern philosophy so mm -hmm reading a lot of like Alan Watts and oh, yeah. Krishnamurti, that kind of thing. And like, it's, it's certainly like inspired a lot of lyrics and inspired a lot of songs, but after a while, it, it it's funny. I was thinking about this when you mentioned earlier about the Taoists being very hesitant to put 
words to things mm -hmm. and after a while i felt like that was sort of my my way of thinking for a long time but there's another side of that where it can be really valuable <laughs> to right. put words to things at least when you're I mean, when you're processing something like grief, when I was in my early 20s, I think it would have been very helpful back then if I'd done that more often. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, earlier on, like, for example, this album, Grand Luminosity, like I was listening to a, a lot of um, Alan Watts and that kind of thing at that time. So that was a, a very clear inspiration outside of music. Mm. Yeah, so after I kind of stepped away from from being like quite so deeply into those kind of writings, I don't know, I just seem to only really <laughs> like listen to music or uh, swim in the sea. Mm. So would you say you kind of uh, settled into just a, a comfortable space of just being who you are and kind of just riding the flow of whatever whatever comes yes I mean I'm, I certainly feel like um, you know I've done music for so long now that I, I'm not going to change like my philosophy I, I hope will I'm sure will always be like, I'm just going to make whatever comes out. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the way that sh music should be made. Mm. Um, and, you know, like, whether, whether or not that continues to grow an audience, I don't know, but I, I don't have any control over it either way. So right. Right. Uh, I, I do have to... Yes, I guess it's a daily practice for everyone to like learn how to ride the waves. Mm. Yeah, yeah. One last question. Thinking about all the musicians out there that are slogging it, they're trying hard, they're trying to live the dream, or maybe they're even just starting out, what if you could leave them with some of the most valuable insight that you've obtained over the years what would that be and what would you say to other musicians that are that are trying hard to express themselves or may but maybe still floundering about i would say i had a conversation with a friend a couple of days ago who's been releasing music for a long time as well and we were just talking a bit about how much things have changed and I've kind of come to this conclusion over the last few years that because everything has changed so much just in the way that music is released and the way it's consumed that everyone's path really is different and um, so what might work well for someone might not work at all for you and vice versa and i do think it's it's really important just to to follow your own path in that way because it's it's certainly no longer it no longer seems to be a clear-cut thing of mm, yeah. okay like you sign with the label they promote the album you get an audience you tour like it's definitely not quite so simple anymore and uh, so my, my advice for anyone and like to, I have to remind myself as well is just that everyone's path is different and just uh, yeah just do what you feel is right rather than worrying too much about what seems to be working for other people that's yep that's very sage words. I think I need to remind myself of that too, almost on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that I run into the risk of when over the course of the past couple months now, as I've started really more actively interviewing musicians, 
coming to the table with no presumptions mm -hmm. and trying mm -hmm. to be as open to whatever happens in that experience and I, th yeah, I think that's you, a great thing I think you're right about about the musicality thing you have to you have to find your own voice you have to find your own path there is no one right path and just try and be as sincere as you can I think in, mm -hmm. in whatever you do for sure well I my friend Will thank you so much for your time I'm just really uh, astounded I love the music it's been a treat it's just it's just beautiful, beautiful works, and I'm coming from a beautiful soul, and I'm just really just enamored to have had this opportunity to just speak with you, to hear your music, and I, I just wish you all the very best in everything that you put your, your hands to. So, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a, a real pleasure for me as well. Well, sage words and a wonderful conversation. I just loved every bit of it. My thanks to Will Samson for his time, for his generosity, and for sharing his music with us. My thanks also goes to his management, Manners McDade, along with Someone Great PR and Dance Promotions. Thank you so much for the relational and the musical hookups. You can find the brand new release from Will Sampson. It's called Harp Swells, and you can find it out at his website, willsampson.bandcamp.com, along with other releases like Active Imagination, which is available on limited edition 12-inch vinyl and CD. Thank you so much, my friends, for tuning in to Ambient Discourses, conversations with musicians and composers who create musical experiences and sonic landscapes. Until next time. <laughs>